I'm supposed to talk today on polycystic ovarian disease, <coughs> which is a very topical subject, involves multi specialities, and because its gynecological implications are so obvious, as a gynecologist, we become the first specialist to be tackling these patients. It has become a lifestyle disease with good nutrition, large body weights. We have size XXL and even more for the average person today in a way indicating the growth of our society, but at the same time bringing with it its own set of medical complications and PCOS or PCOD is one of the commonest problems which we are facing thanks to obesity, thanks to lifestyle changes and unfortunately as a problem once it affects the patient, then the patient has to go through with it almost for a lifetime. Like I said, as a gynecologist, we become the first line of approach for these patients. But because of their multiple implications, these patients also seek remedy from other specialists. And these include dermatologists, these include obesity consultants, these include bariatric surgeons and of course, we take help of many other specialists including ultrasonologists, radiomineracea specialists, all to arrive at a good diagnosis. In fact, some of these slides are very self-explanatory, but I will just go through them rather briefly. It is a very vast subject. And while I've, I will try to concise the subject to relevant details which would be applicable to this audience, on the slides we will have a lot more details, some of which I may just go through rather rapidly. It is the most common endocrinopathy in women of reproductive age group. It is a heterogeneous syndrome with chronic anovulation, not inovulation, and hyperandrogenism in the absence of other causes. The first question a patient with PCOS will come and ask you is Dr. Why me? Well, we still do not know the causes. The current research suggests that a genetic predisposition to insulin resistance is the most likely cause and therefore has a prime role as far as the etiology is concerned. In the evolution of the disease, from the time of Stein and Leventhal right in early 30s when they thought it was just a simple situation of amenorrhea, infertility, obesity and hirsutism, we have come a long way. We know today that it has got a huge metabolic impact on multiple organ systems which can affect a patient almost lifelong. Fortunately, with increasing understanding, a wide variety of therapeutic options are available and therefore, early identification of patients at risk and prompt initiation of therapy, of course followed by long-term surveillance and management will promote long-term health in these PCOS patients. It goes by various names, Stein, Leventhal, two individuals who picked up this condition, like I said in the early 30s, have been treated with this syndrome and therefore it goes by the Stein-Leventhal syndrome. In fact, when we were appearing for our MBBS, this used to always come as a short note, Stein-Leventhal syndrome. And we knew so little about it that the answer could be comprised in barely one or two lines. Today, we have books on PCOS, literally volumes on PCOS and after reading which you still feel that there are so many questions unanswered. Polycystic ovarian disease is one of the common terminologies that are used. 
The other ones are very scientific though not commonly used sclerocystic disease, functional ovarian hyperandrogenism and hyperandrogenic chronic anovulation. In fact, this last three would explain to you a fair amount as to what the pathology behind the entire disease process is. Stein and Leventhal first reported it in 1935 and they said that the heterogeneous syndrome complex characterized by persistent hyperandrogenic chronic anovulation and frequently associated with hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance with resulting menstrual irregularity, infertility and hirsutism. Now, this summarizes the whole thing. You have chronic anovulation, obviously the other things would follow, oligomenorrhea would be a consequence of that. Amenorrhea less commonly is also present, infertility obviously will be present with that. We know that there is insulin resistance, presence of insulin antibodies and therefore hyperinsulinemia is also common and this entire thing when you bunch it into a syndrome is what we understand as polycystic ovarian syndrome. It affects 5 to 10 percent of all reproductive age group and of course it is the leading cause of infertility. In fact, today when I see an infertile patient, if I have ruled out a male factor and if I know that the tubes are patent, believe me, 80 to 90 percent of these patients, believe me, would be anovulatory, possibly PCOS. Now, it therefore becomes one of the leading causes of anovulation and infertility. Out of the patients presenting in infertility clinics, therefore 50 percent almost have PCOS which is a huge big number and therefore if you have mastered PCOS, you can master so many of these infertile patients and offer them good help with positive outcome. Therefore, this becomes a very important subject. Additionally, these are patients where even if you help them to conceive, the chance of an early pregnancy wastage is very high, not only once but subsequent also because basic oocyte quality and the hormonal milieu in which that oocyte is maturing since it is a hyperandrogenic milieu with excess LH in the system, recurrent miscarriage becomes a huge big problem and therefore, not only do you have to help them to conceive, but only when you control the disease can you help the pregnancy to go nicely up to term. A little bit of understanding as to how successful ovulation happens and here very briefly we will go through the feedback mechanisms which allow a proper oocyte to mature and ultimately rupture resulting in ovulation. Sufficient deficit stimulation for initial follicular recruitment is very, very important. As you know at the end of the previous cycle, the circulating levels of estrogen and progesterone, the very low circulating levels of estrogen and progesterone cause a significant negative feedback and outpouring of FSH from the pituitary and therefore leads to development of a crop of follicles and when these crop of follicles one of them gets destined to form a dominant follicle and that dominant follicle ultimately becomes a lead follicle which by virtue of a positive feedback I mean the estradiol produced by the positive uh, uh, dominant follicle then has a positive feedback with FSH which leads to a rapid growth of that.